Hello, hello, hello. I'm particularly delighted today to be joined by Omar Baguti, who is a Palestinian human rights activist. He is the co-founder of the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions movement, which we're going to be talking about and how you can help uh, fight the horrific oppression of the Palestinians, including the current mass slaughter. And he was also the recipient, quite rightly, of the 2017 Gandhi Peace Award. It's such an honor to speak to you today, Omar. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much, Owen, for having me. Just explain what when we talk about BDS in the midst of this current horror. What what's the relevance? What's the kind of basis for for us even having this conversation right now? Well, this is the most important question I think, which is how can Israel carry on the world's first live streamed genocide, first in history, never happened before. Not even the U.S. Empire managed to do a live streamed genocide. So all the genocides have been. Uh, uh, in the dark, mostly. Uh, but this uh, Israel, Israel's army is flashing what it's doing. The intent is so obvious. It's talking about it every single level of government, uh, society. They're talking about the intent to exterminate, to annihilate, to wipe out. They use such horrific language, ethnic cleansing and so on. In the, Israel cannot carry this on without two main legs on which this genocide stands. First, the dehumanizing, extremely racist narrative, uh, uh, which much of the Western mainstream media has participated in, in, in uh, spreading, uh, unfortunately. And the US president obviously played his own role in amplifying the lies and fabrications uh, produced by the Israel propaganda machine. Uh, so this extreme dehumanization of the Palestinians, demonization and so on. And it's it's not rare. Uh, colonial regimes do that quite often to their subjects, so to speak. And the other leg is the actual complicity, military, diplomatic, political, corporate uh, complicity, institutional complicity, w without which Israel cannot continue doing this. Quite literally, it cannot. Israeli military experts say without US munitions, they cannot carry on the level of, uh, uh, of uh, indiscriminate bombing that is almost unprecedented in many, many decades. So BDS comes into the picture in challenging both, challenging the dehumanizing narrative, uh, uh, focusing on why Palestinians deserve freedom, justice, equality, self-determination, dignity, like everyone else. And on the second hand, and that's very important, how we cut those links of state, corporate, and institutional complicity. Uh, because that's where everyone can participate. Everyone can do something. The final point I want to say is that, especially in Western countries that are partnering with Israel's regime of oppression in this genocide, and I can ex expand on this, it's not a um, charitable act to end complicity. It's an absolutely profound moral obligation to end complicity, to do no harm. Uh, but, but one can think, how, how am I doing harm? As a citizen of more or less quasi-democratic states, everyone is part of a city, is part of a, paying taxes, is part of a union, is part of some association where they can have some relative influence. That's where BDS works. How can we mobilize this pressure to end complicity, to do no harm to the Palestinians? If you cannot do any good, at least make sure you're not doing harm. And this point, I think, about complicity is, is so key. You often see apologists for Israel's mass slaughter and oppression of the Palestinians looking around the world at X, Y or Z injustice taking place, injustices they don't actually care about and never talk about, to go, why aren't you talking about this? Why aren't you talking about X, Y or Z? You know, I interviewed Jeremy Scarhill, the brilliant US investigative journalist who made the point Joe Biden could end all of this in a phone call. Um, so it's that point that Western states arm and back um, Israel. So it's a kind of ethical point of this is in our name, but it's a hard nose point, isn't it? Which is this only can continue with the active support of the Western backers of the Israeli state. Absolutely. And there's something that citizens can do. If you live in a completely authoritarian, non-democratic regime, that's very little citizens can do to pressure regimes. As we know, in several Arab dictatorships and in, in dictatorships in, 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 in much of the global south, there's hardly anything citizens can do. So we work with big associations, big unions that have some impact. We scandalize those regimes, but in more or less democratic countries, and it's becoming much less in the last few years, uh, um, there is something that everyone can do. 
In terms of just before I ask you about, I suppose, mm. the pillars, boycott, divestment, sanctions, so we can unpick what this is, because that helps, obviously, people understand what they can also do and be part of the movement. Um, this emerged now, well, I suppose, nearly two decades ago. What was the base? What was the kind of basis for it emerging? What was like, why that? Why that moment? What was the kind of this? This is what is missing right now. This is why we need to do this now. BDS was launched in 2005 by the absolute majority of entities representing Palestinian society, both inside historic Palestine as well as in exile. Um, why is this important to mention? Because the Palestinian people, according to the latest statistics, is divided into three main constituencies. 38% are in the occupied Gaza Strip and West Bank, including East Jerusalem. 12% are Palestinian citizens of present-day Israel. And a whole 50% are Palestinians in exile. Mm -hmm. Even among Palestinians in the state of Israel, in the West Bank and Gaza, there's a very large minority who are internally displaced persons, internal refugees, <laughs> who cannot go home because they're the wrong type, basically. So that's why BDS, from the very start, focused on the basic rights, as stipulated in international law, UN resolutions, and so on, of the three main constituencies, ending the occupation, ending the system of racial domination and segregation, which meets the UN definition of apartheid, as Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, Beth Salem, and many Palestinian organizations have said, and third and foremost, the rights of Palestinian refugees in in international law to return home and to receive reparations. So by this, we address the basic tenets of Palestinian rights under international law, which are necessary for self-determination, as the UN itself has said. Uh, this is where almost all Palestinians have a consensus. Very, very few Palestinian entities disagree with this uh, three-plank approach, basically. To, uh, to, to achieve those rights, the BDS movements as, as a rights movement is anchored in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So it rejects all forms of racism, including anti-Semitism, anti-Black racism, Islamophobia, sexism, anti-queer discrimination, uh, anti-Indigenous, and so on and so forth. It, it's a very morally consistent movement in that sense, and it's very intersectional. It works with other justice movements uh, to achieve global justice against all forms of oppression. It is inspired by the South African anti-apartheid movement, first and foremost, by the U.S. civil rights movement, Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, and so on, and other struggles. But the most important uh, inspiration for BDS is the very long history of Palestinian popular resistance, which is hardly ever discussed in the Western mainstream media. Uh, uh, Palestinian resistance is reduced to one form, ignoring all the diverse, rich forms of resistance that go back a century, basically, against British colonialism and later Zionist settler colonialism, be it through poetry, through strikes, through boycotts, through such diverse world of popular resistance. And that's where BDS is really rooted in our own history of popular resistance. Uh, the last point I wanted to say is that those ethical and legal pillars of BDS are important, but the, another very important aspect of it is the strategic impact. In a nutshell, BDS tries to reach a golden balance between ethical principles and strategic effectiveness. We are goal-oriented. We want to achieve Palestinian rights. We don't just struggle for the sake of struggling. We don't love to struggle. We do it simply to achieve our rights. To do so, we have to be strategic and impactful. It's not enough to be ethical. It's not enough to have the legal argument. We have to be impactful. That's why we have clear criteria on how to select a BDS target, for example, and so on and so forth. And as I said, we work with movements across the world, unions, farmers unions, uh, um, progressive Jewish groups, uh, um, uh, LGBT groups, climate justice groups, across the world that support BDS count in the tens of millions of supporters. So it's a really global movement, Global South, Global North, and it has a Palestinian leadership, which is the largest coalition in Palestinian society. In incredible, inspiring stuff. Um, let's just <clears throat> take apart then the BDS, each constituent, each pillar, let's, let's, let's go through them. So boycott. I mean, that, I think for most people, that, that sounds probably the most straightforward, but w tell me about what, what, what are we boycotting? Uh, what kind of boycott campaigns exist? What kind of, uh, you know, big, big examples you'd like to draw attention to? 
Sure. Uh, Israel's regime of settler colonialism and apartheid, which is 75 years old, is not just relying on the military aspect. That's the most obvious aspect that people see. It's relying on the involvement, the, the, the complicity of many institutions, Israeli academic institutions, cultural institutions, corporations, and so on, as well as international corporations and institutions. So BDS, as far as the B is concerned, the boycott, goes after not just consumer boycotts, not just against corporations that are enabling this 75-year-old regime of oppression, but also academic boycotts, cultural boycotts, uh, uh, sports boycotts, and so on and so forth. So it's in every aspect where there's complicity. Again, this, this is very much inspired by the South African anti-apartheid movement. I was personally part of that movement when I went to college in, in New York. I was very much involved in the South African anti-apartheid movement on campus as a tiny little part of that movement, but it's, it was extremely inspiring uh, for me to see how it works, the strategies, and, and so on. Uh, because the boycott it touches on all these fields, everyone can participate. Everyone can, at the very least, join a group that boycotts a specific uh, company. But we ask people to be strategic. In other words, we have to be targeted. You can't go with those long lists of tens and tens of companies to boycott just because they are complicit. Indeed, they may be complicit. There are hundreds of companies and banks that are complicit. But to be effective, to be impactful, we select a few targets, and we go very hard against them through collective efforts globally. And when we bring them to their knees, those big, nasty corporations, we teach every other corporation a lesson. Mm -hmm. And indeed, we have succeeded. Just a few weeks ago, Puma, one of the largest sporting goods uh, co corporation, announced that it will not renew its contract with the Israel Football Association. Uh, which uh, expires in December 2024. Why did it have to announce it so early? Because it was under immense pressure and its reputation as a socially responsible company was, was really being tarnished. So it had to come out, especially during this genocide, and say, oh, oh I'm, I'm, I'm ending this, I'm, I'm not continuing this. So that's how it works. Global impact, all focused on a few targets. Divestment, D, what are we talking about? Divestment is more institutional, uh, is uh, by city councils, by pension funds, by church funds. I'll just give some concrete examples uh, so that we won't stay in the abstract. Uh, through our partners, we've managed to convince some major sovereign funds, investment funds, like the Norwegian pension fund, the oil fund, the largest sovereign fund in the world, to divest from companies and banks involved in Israel's occupation, settlements, and other violations of human rights. Similarly, uh, uh, in Luxembourg, the Netherlands, New Zealand, major funds have, have divested from companies that are involved in, in oppression of the Palestinians. The United Methodist Church, the Presbyterian Church, the United Church of Christ in the United States, I know in the UK, churches may not be that rich and have big investments. In the US, they are quite rich and they have big investments. Through our partners in those churches, we've convinced their pension funds to divest from many companies. The United Methodist Church, for example, divested in 2016, not just from G4S, the biggest security company in the world, but also from all Israeli banks because they were all financing oppression, the occupation and settlements uh, and so on. So divestment is working to convince investors to pull out their money. And, and, and this is very, very important for us at an institutional level. S, yes, sanctions. This might be a lot of people, when they hear sanctions, they, they often hear US-led sanctions. That's what the, in their head. Yeah. I remember, you know, as a teenager, the sanctions on Iraq. And so people often think, well, these are, these are terrible things. They cause terrible suffering. So what do you, what does BDS mean by sanctions? It's a very good point, actually, because yes, sanctions in people's minds is very much connected to the horrible criminal, not just horrible, US-led sanctions against uh, countries, devastating countries like Cuba, uh, uh, Iraq, as you mentioned, and others. We are absolutely opposed to those forms of blanket illegal sanctions. The only S that we advocate in the BDS movement is lawful, targeted, proportionate sanctions that hit the main entities responsible for the system of settler colonialism and apartheid. It doesn't hurt uh, uh, innocent bystanders, so to speak. So we would always oppose any sanctions that cut off 
uh, food supplies, cut off medicines, cut off you know essentials that can hurt uh, people. Uh, uh, military embargo is one example of, of an accountability measure that is foremost on our list of measures that need to be taken to, to compel Israel's system of oppression to respect Palestinian rights. But there's so many others. Expelling Israel from the United Nations General Assembly, a UN special rapporteur for uh, housing actually proposed this in the current genocide, that this is the way to force Israel to respect international law and to stop this genocide, as happened with apartheid South Africa. It was expelled from the UN. Uh, uh, the Olympics, uh, FIFA, these are all international forums, very much dominated by Western powers, the US and, and European powers, but there's a lot that the global South can do and progressive uh, states can do to push Israel out of those uh, 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 forums. So those are various forms of sanctions that can be from very small to very big. In the United Nations, we're pushing for reviving the UN Special Committee on Apartheid, which has played a, fair, which ha played a very important role in bringing down apartheid in South Africa. Uh, we hope that they will revive it. We, we want to push for it to be revived eventually, because ultimately, even when we stop this genocide, the, the repercussions will not go away. The oppression will not go away. It's, it's, it's a decades old system, and we need to address that root cause of the current crisis. It is a apartheid because we keep mentioning the power of apartheid South Africa. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a geriatric millennial. It was just before my time. My dad was involved. He wants, as he likes to tell me, shared a bottle of Coke with Tom and Becky back in the 60s in, 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 in Brighton. Um, but, but one of the things that strikes me about that parallel is white South Africans for a very long time, most of them walked into apartheid South Africa. And, you know, when it ended, lots of white South Africans voted. It was, the referendum was quite narrow in terms of white South Africans voting against. I think it was 55, 45. It was pretty narrow. And a lot of the white South Africans who voted to end apartheid did so reluctantly because they felt they had no choice. Mm -hmm. um, now, if we look now, you know, I keep interviewing Israeli peace activists who I'm always in awe of, uh, but they are marginalized. There's this young man, this young soldier, Refusenik, who lots <clears> of people <throat> on social media have been rightly applauding. There's only one Refusenik amongst this whole horror so far. That's a soldier who, for those who don't know, is a conscientious objector. Um, the polling of Israeli Jews at the moment is 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 very bleak in terms of, you know, for example, a large majority, according to World Poll, support ethnically cleansing Gaza. So I'm just interested in maybe part of the hard-nosed approach, using that parallel of apartheid South Africa in terms of how actually white South Africans have to be convinced the game is up. This is not possible to maintain anymore. Why this is important, given public opinion in, in, in Israel? It's very important, yes. And, and, and the parallels, uh, it's important to, to maintain a perspective about the parallels and the differences. Um, in apartheid South Africa, you're absolutely right. The absolute majority of whites were part of the system uh, and they voted against it when they were forced to, basically. It, was, it, it, it couldn't continue. It was unsustainable. Uh, South Africa has become ungovernable, and they had to end this, basically. Uh, um, among Jewish Israelis, it is a settler colonial state, as in South Africa. It is an apartheid state, as in South Africa. But the support it has from global powers is far beyond anything South African apartheid could have dreamt of, in fact. Uh, yes, it was supported by, by Thatcher and Reagan and, and the big corporations and so on, but not to this level. I mean, during this current genocidal war on Palestinians in Gaza, where everything is live streamed, you can see how the big hegemonic powers are doing everything they can to shield Israel from accountability, from basic accountability to international law. So this shows how much work we need to do to uh, build people power, to push for policy change. So going back to your question, given those, the, this major difference that, that, that the Israeli regime, despite being a much smaller country, not very rich in resources, unlike South Africa, so the world really needed South Africa for so many things, yeah. Israel is, is, is quite weaker in that sense, but its political diplomatic power is immense, immense because it's part of this Western club completely, an honorary part of this Western yeah. hegemonic uh, colonial club. Now, if one takes a picture of Israeli society, a, a, a snapshot, as I, I usually say in, in my talks, of Israeli society today, it's completely bleak and, and depressing. 
the support for fascist tendencies, for genocidal tendencies, for ethnic cleansing, 83% of Jewish Israelis support ethnic cleansing today in Gaza. 83% that leaves hardly anyone. Uh, uh, how can anyone find any reason for hope? Uh, um, some people say, how can we ever coexist with anything like this society? Uh, um, in any form, I mean, be it a one-state solution, democratic state, two-state, whatever case, how can anyone coexist with this level of support for depraved, sadistic, genocidal policies? People are showing on TikToks their videos torturing Palestinians uh, and bragging and laughing, and it's shown on mainstream TV in Israel, and people love it, and, and they have so many followers. How can you deal with this? But it's a snapshot. Settler colonial societies can be quite depraved. And we've seen that the French in Algeria, the white Africaners in South Africa, uh, the Brits in, in, in North America, Australia, and so we've seen it. Settler colonies can be extremely savage and depraved and, and, and genocidal. That's okay. how settler colonies work. Okay. But, it, but it's also a snapshot. When resistance to this uh, um, oppression, and I'm taking resistance in the, in the broad sense, especially in ending complicity, takes its toll. Then we start seeing the divisions. This, mm. this uh, appearance of we're all united, yes, let's delete them from existence, let's uh, exterminate them, and so on, will start dissipating, and we'll start seeing more people saying, well, we cannot live in a world that considers us a pariah. We cannot live in a world where we are seen as depraved savages. We, we just cannot do this. We've got to end this. Uh, uh, I don't want to live in a country where my child will go to the army and kill people, kill children uh, at the rate they're doing it in, in Gaza today. It's just not who I am. Uh, I, 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 so, but people don't reach this on their own. We need pressure. We need global pressure. We need ending complicity to get to that point where many Israelis start questioning their system, whether it's sustainable or not. And then the moral argument and the legal argument become much more effective. So first and foremost, it's pressure. And we think pressure is most effective with Israel in particular from the outside, because unlike South Africa, it is extremely dependent on those global markets, much, much, much more than South Africa, actually. So it's much more vulnerable in a way. Before I ask the final point, just about how people get involved, um, in terms of the attacks on BDS, so you often get attacks along the lines of uh, that is anti-Semitism, why single out the state of Israel? And also, well, I mean, look, if we're honest, any, for any form of resistance is n none of them acceptable. I mean, this, this is quite an interesting point, I think, in of itself, isn't it? Which is, it, the argument is always you're doing it wrong. This is no, no form of resistance is ever legitimate uh, because this is a peaceful movement. But I'm just interested in how you respond to those accusations that this is this is anti-semitism because you know in, in the uk at the moment there's a deliberate attempt by the government to uh, make it illegal um and you, in germany and um, the obviously huge direct complicity of the german state and i have to say most of the german people at the time in the holocaust um that now is being um the, the reparations mm -hmm. there are basically that the palestinians must pick up the tab so I'm just interested, and, and, and there you're getting a huge stigmatization of BDS there as well. So I'm just interested, how do you respond to those attacks? Okay, first, it's important to say that BDS is not illegal in any country yet. I mean, not for lack of trying. They really tried across the US and in Western states and in Germany, in the UK, in France. France was the most advanced in trying, but they have not succeeded because it is based on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, on, on basic principles of human rights, it's non-discriminatory, anti-racist, and it's non-violent. It's extremely difficult to make such a movement illegal, except if you're ready to sacrifice any respect for freedom of expression. So if you, you know, destroy uh, Britain's respect for freedom of expression, then yes, then you can destroy BDS, but then what? Then you go after the unions. And then you go after the Black Lives Matter, and then you go after every justice movement that government doesn't like. Yeah. And don't this, encourage them. Don't encourage them. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I think I think they the people understand this. For example, the the coalition in in the UK led by PSC, the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, but the coalition working against the anti BDS legislation that the Conservative government is trying to pass is so broad, so huge because people get it. 
they know, like McCarthyism in the US, it will never stop at the declared targets. Once it tries uh, to undo the freedom of expression of the declared target, they go after other targets. We know the conservative government is trying to undermine unions and they would be next. We know they don't like the climate justice movement that is becoming much more radicalized and much more effective. They want to undermine it. They will go after it. If they manage to suppress a freedom of expression on BDS, they'll go after all the rest. So this intersectionality is very important, not just on, a, on an ethical uh, level, but also from a very pragmatic political level. Everyone should be concerned when freedom of expression is targeted. Going back to the issue of anti-Semitism, the very accusation is anti-Semitic. Allow me to explain. Saying that criticism of Israel, calling for a boycott of Israel, uh, 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 condemning Israeli apartheid, condemning Israeli genocide is anti-Semitic, assumes that Israel and the Jews are one and the same. Israel speaks for all Jews, represents all Jews. If you attack Israel, you're attacking the Jews. Mm -hmm. This is as anti-Semitic as it gets because it takes away any Jewish diversity. It, it's as if all Jews are responsible for what Israel does. Only anti-Semites make this argument that all Jews are responsible for what Israel does. Well, what we say is that there's nothing in Judaism, there's nothing about Judaism, about Jewishness, that is genocidal. Apartheid, genocide, ethnic cleansing is not a Jewish value. Saying otherwise is obviously anti-Semitic. So when we attack Israeli genocide, apartheid system, settler colonialism, we're attacking oppression. We're attacking a system of injustice. How does this relate to Jews? Saying that it's anti-Semitic is extremely dangerous because it says Jewishness is about apartheid and genocide and so on, which is the epitome of anti-Semitism. That's one point. The other point is that the BDS call itself, some people forget this, it's one page. I really suggest to people watching this to read it. It's just one page. Even TikTok generation people can read it. It's just one page, you can manage. Uh, uh, down there, it says, we call on conscientious Israelis to join us in this movement to achieve justice, freedom, equality, and so on. Even that call that was signed by every main entity in Palestinian society, considers Israelis are potential allies if they become anti-colonial, anti-Zionist. They can join us in this movement. So we don't foreclose the possibility of working together, what we call co-resistance with anti-Zionist Israelis against the system of oppression that Israel is. So from the very beginning, and as a matter of principle, we've opposed anti-Jewish racism. Now, the problem is Israel is Israel realized that it failed completely with its anti-Semitism charges, so it flipped the very definition. Israel, with its allies in the West, suddenly started adopting this IHRA working definition of anti-Semitism, which is fraudulent, which is bogus, which focuses on Israel rather than racism, hate, and bigotry against Jews. It throws Jewish communities under the bus, as Jewish progressives have, have said. It actually undermines the struggle against real anti-Semitism because it makes everything against Israel is anti-Semitic. So all those Jewish activists in the US, in the UK, in Germany, are being called anti-Semitic today. A Jewish Voice for Peace that has led inspiring sit-ins and occupations across the United States against Israel's genocide, saying, not in our name, never again for everyone, and never again is now, they are being accused by the Anti-Defamation League and you know big yeah. Israel lobby groups of anti-Semitism. So if they're anti-Semitic, who's not? This is really diluting, destroying the very definition of anti-Semitism. Which is dangerous because it stops us able to being able to combat actual anti-Semitism. Um, and and Owen, just one last point. Israel's regime of oppression is in bed with the anti-Semites of the world. Mm. Evangelical Christian Zionists are as, as anti-Semitic as it gets. Mm -hmm. They're waiting for the Messiah to come, convert all Jews or kill them all. How more anti-Semitic can you get? Yet Israel considers them their most reliable strategic ally in the United States. Orban in Hungary, Modi yeah. in India, and so on and so forth. The anti-Semites of the world are Israel's mm -hmm. best friends today. Such, a, such an important point, that particularly Viktor Orban, who leads an overtly anti-Semitic regime and his best buddies with uh, Netanyahu. Um, just finally, and, you know, and as well as you can add anything that, that I've, mi I've missed in terms of asking, but how can people get involved? I, and I ask this because I know this reading through the comments at the moment, 
um, of all the videos that I do, people feel so angry and so traumatized by what they're watching that they feel quite helpless. They feel they're just, they're going kind of mad. They're watching these, as you say, a live stream genocide. That's how people feel. But they don't feel any agency. They, they just feel all they can do is watch and, and tweet their fury and their anger. So what can people actually do? How can they be part of BDS? So they're taking this, this huge anger and trauma that they feel and putting it where they, they can actually help make this horrible nightmare end. This is extremely important because absolutely you're right. We need to channel that anger and the sympathy and the charitable feelings, but mainly the anger at the hypocrisy. You know, talking about Ukraine, but not Palestine. Talking about, you know, this cherry picking where you want to apply international law is destroying the very tenets of international law as we speak. Mm -hmm. The ICC's hypocrisy and so on. So what people can do, it's a very general question and that could take a lot of time to, to respond to. But I'll try to give samples of what people can do, depending where they are. If you're a worker in a trade union, uh, then there's a lot to do in that trade union. Uh, if you're, everyone is part of a city, you live in a city, so there's a city council. And if you're in a quasi-democratic country like yours, there, there you have some influence on, on city councils, basically. And, and we've used that influence in the past to exclude companies involved in Israel's apartheid. So, for example, people, what people can do, ch challenge the narrative, first and foremost, reject this racist, dehumanizing narrative of Palestinians, insist that Palestinians are equal humans to everyone else and deserve equal rights to everyone else. We cannot allow this live genocide. We cannot allow our, our politicians to lie to us. Second, end complicity. The most morally profound moral obligation is to end complicity. So how is any person in, complicit? How, how, how is their institution complicit? Well, as, as we said, states, institutions, and corporations are complicit. But what can an individual do? I mean, I cannot really affect the Sunak government, so what do you want me to do? If I'm part of an association, I can raise my voice, call for ceasefire, ending the siege, uh, accountability, remind people that it's it's it, this crisis that, that did not come in in a vacuum. And there's a 75 year old regime that has led us to this moment, uh, and work to boycott in collectives uh, companies that are targeted that are involved in the genocide first and, and foremost. Uh, in in the UK, for example, you would look for the main solidarity groups, PSC in this case, tr some trade unions. Uh, some other groups that are involved in solidarity work and work with them to target specific companies. Uh, work with them to influence city councils to stop procuring, contracting companies involved in grave human rights violations writ large, not Palestine specific. I cannot convince the city of London today to adopt a policy to stop contracting companies involved in Israeli apartheid. It, we don't have the power. We need a lot more power to push the city of London to do this. But we have enough power intersectionally with all the other justice movements to push the City Council of London to stop procurement contracts with any company involved in grave human rights violations according to international law, period, without specifying Israel, Palestine, or anything else. If we pass that guideline, then we can go with our list, UN list, uh, other lists by, by, by Palestinian, Israeli, international, uh, human rights groups that have lists of companies involved in, in, in wrongdoing and say, okay, you've excluded companies that have done grave violations. Here's a list that you should exclude. So that's something that everyone uh, can do. Uh, of influencing your MP. So we said you cannot influence the state yet, but everyone in semi-democratic countries has member of parliament that they can approach, that they can influence. Alone, you cannot do much. <clears throat> no MP will listen to you if you're just an individual. But if you're an influencer with millions of followers, you have much more influence. If you come with a big group of, big alliance of groups and speak to the MP, I'm speaking on behalf of all these entities, which means that you won't get our vote next time unless you listen. Then they will listen. Then they will take, you know, they'll be much more keen to hear what you have to say to them. So it's all about power. We need to build more power. And everyone can do it, but it's important to remember it has to be collective action. Individual action can go so far and you get frustrated. I'm not achieving results. The final point I wanted to say is that when you despair in the UK, in France, in South Africa, in Chile, when you despair 
that we're working and demonstrating massive demonstrations everywhere, 800,000 in London, uh, day in and day out, we're doing sit-ins, occupations, disruptions, peaceful disruptions of all complicit companies and so on. And we really encourage disruptions, by the way, peaceful disruptions. And yet it's not working. People say it's not working. The Sunak government is sending weapons to Israel. It's participating with the US in protecting Israel from accountability to international and so on. The regime, this hegemonic Western regime of power is designed to make you give up, to instill hopelessness in your mind that it's impossible to change. Be it a trade union struggle at any climate justice struggle, they just keep bombarding you with the impossibility of change. But never give up because we, you never know when the tipping point will arrive. And if you despair, what should we do, Palestinians, especially our sisters and brothers under the bombing in Gaza? If you despair, what do you expect them to do? Do not despair because we need you. We need you to end complicity, to do no harm, first and foremost. So never give up. The tipping point will come. I think it's an incredibly moving place to end. And if there's any good that's come out of this hideous evil, um, and truly it is one of the great atrocities of our age, um, then it is the fact that I think many, many people have woken up. They've become politicized. I think lots of people, frankly, have watched this and don't quite see the world in in the same way. I think the you know Western hypocrisy has always been there, but in such stark colors, which is so difficult to ignore. Um, I mean, there's very little precedent, I think. So, well, there's no precedent in, 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 my, in my lifetime. And you see now the polling shows the younger generations mm -hmm. are the most pro-Palestinian yes. that have ever existed. Um, and I do think Israel actually should panic about the fact that in the longer term, certainly, in the medium's longer term, there's a big shift taking place in public opinion, particularly amongst those younger millennials, Gen Z. Um, and I think we'll see the impact of that. The support for BDS is only going to grow from here on in. Um, and that's in large part down to the work of people like yourself, very and others. It's such an inspiring role that you've you've played. It's often been a hugely thankless uh, and difficult um, um, role that you've that you've taken up, uh, as it is for many leaders in, in your place. Um, but it's hugely inspiring to see what you've achieved. And, and I know many, many people watching and listening to this um, will feel indebted to you, but also will 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 have listened to you and want to want to do something. So thank you so so much. Really really appreciate it. And please like and subscribe. Do share this video. But a special thank you to the brilliant Emma Bagiti. Thank you so much.